So I'm going to talk about machine learning for weather and climate modeling. And before I do this, I just have one slide to introduce um, what we are at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, which is a bit of a mouthful. And also the acronym ECMWF is not much better. But in principle, we are um, a research institute and we are also an, an operational weather service for medium range um, weather predictions. And this basically means like um, global weather predictions a couple of days into the future, but also all the way to, um, to monthly predictions and also seasonal forecasts. And we're also hosting some of the Copernicus climate services. So we're also involved in climate services in principle. We are an independent intergovernmental organization um, and we have um, 34 member states that are depicted on the right here. And um, we originally are based in Reading, um, and that's why I, I am at the moment. But um, we now also have a second facility in Bologna, and we're, su we're also opening right now a new facility in Bonn. Um, and this is actually also one of the reasons why I'm here, because we're now go going to be also placed in North rhine westphalia And actually, I'm also going to move, for example, to Bonn in spring, so there's more going to be more of it in Germany. And as we do operational weather predictions, we are the home of two supercomputers. And we are also the home of what we call the integrated forecast system, which is one of the leading global weather prediction systems of the world. Um, why would machine learning help in weather and climate predictions just in principle? Um, if you want to do weather predictions or um, climate predictions, it's, it's a difficult task to do. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, the, the Earth is very big and um, this means even if you run the, the fastest supercomputers in the world, um, you will still not be able to resolve all the important processes that are in there. For example, um, individual clouds are not going to be resolved in the models typically. And there's a bit of background noise, so if everyone could um, check whether they have muted their mic, that would be great. Um, this basically means that there are kind of errors in principle inside of those simulations, and also it's a chaotic system, so errors are going to grow exponentially. Um, and also, uh, some of the processes that are involved in this very complex systems are actually not really understood very well. So it's also um, that, that we don't know everything we would need to know. And to make it even more worse, um, we have a lot of components in the Earth system. So, for example, land surface, atmosphere, atmospheric chemistry, ocean, and so on and so forth. And all of those components interact with each other. So it's just a very complex, nonlinear um, system that needs to be simulated. But the good news is um, that we also have a huge number of observations available for this Earth system. So just to give you a number, we, we're receiving around 800 million observations at, every day at ESNWF. And at the same time, we're also producing a lot of model output. And we actually have something like hundreds of terabytes, uh, hundreds of petabytes of primary data um, of, uh, about this Earth system um, lying around at, at these WF data storage. <coughs> And if you now put those two points together, so you basically have um, a prediction system, uh, a system that you need to predict, which is very complex and very nonlinear. But on the other hand, you also have a lot of data. Then it's kind of clear that machine learning is a tool that will actually help you to extract information um, from data and also very complicated information, for example, nonlinear systems um, could actually help you. And therefore, machine learning is basically explored in a lot of different application areas across, across our workflow um, in principle. And on the other hand, um, it's also fair to say we need supercomputers for our predictions and machine learning at the moment has a very, very strong impact on high performance computing and supercomputing. And therefore, even if we're not interested in machine learning per se, we should still be interested in machine learning from a machine uh, from a high performance computing type um, ag agenda. So um, what do you mean by many application areas? So this is our workflow that we have at ESNWF. So we're basically um, collecting observations and then we perform data simulation where it brings observations and the model trajectories together to generate initial conditions. Then we run our numerical weather forecasts into the future with models. And then finally, we basically take the model output and perform um, post-processing and dissemination. And underlying this is big high performance and um, big data infrastructure, which is also very relevant. And if I now plot all the different machine learning applications that we are investigating into the slides, um, you will be a little bit overwhelmed, and I'm sorry about that. I promise not to go into any details here, but basically what I would want to convince you is that we not we don't have the one machine learning applications, but we rather have many of those applications. So each of those boxes around the workflow is now representing one of the application areas where we are looking into at the moment and, and trying to explore whether machine learning can actually make a difference here. And we're still in the exploration state, so it's not that this everything is finished and everything is well known. We're just a couple of years in, basically, in, into the use of, of very sophisticated machine learning tools, and we're still exploring. Um, it's also interesting times because um, right now there's a project coming up, which is called Destination Earth. 
And Destination Earth is basically the, the aim of this big European Union project is to build what we call digital twins of the Earth systems. And I've shown you this um, figure on the left here before, but what I haven't told you is that there are two sides of this figure, and one side of the figure is actually giving you an observation from a satellite, and the other one is giving you um, a, 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 the output of a model simulation about the cloud fields. And I'll leave it to you to decide which one is which. Basically, the message should be that we are in a state where our high resolution models are actually kind of really sophisticated already, and it's sometimes difficult to, to distinguish between the, the real world and the fields that we observe and the, the model fields that we're simulating. And therefore, we're kind of well, bold enough to state that we will soon be able to build a digital twin of the Earth. And these digital twins are going to build um, to, to, to generate hundreds of terabytes of, per, of data, probably something like 100 of terabytes per day. And therefore, machine learning will be very important actually to extract relevant information, but also to put, for example, user models into place and to really kind of um, make the most of the data that is coming out of those digital twins. And on the other hand, it's also fair to say um, that we are currently in what we call a digital revolution of the Earth system sciences. So we are in, we're needing, we, we, at the moment, we need to revise the way that we actually build up our models anyway, because um, to make use of the, the new next generation of supercomputers with GPUs and accelerators and heterogeneous hardware, um, we actually need to revise the way the, how we write our models and machine learning will play a very big role here as well. Okay, um, so how would machine learning actually um, impact the Destination Earth project that we also like to call Destiny? So there are a couple of, of basically groups of machine learning applications. One of them is that we want to speed up our digital twins. This could, for example, be by the emulation of a, of a specific component of the model. So if you have a very expensive component, you can basically just learn to replace this component by a machine learning tool, which will typically be a more efficient and kind of faster on, on a modern day supercomputers and also more portable. Uh, it could also be used to, for example, reduce numerical position. Um, it can be used, machine learning can be used to optimize the high performance computing and data workflow. Uh, it can potentially also be used for data compression. So it's basically about uh, making everything more efficient, making it, it possible to, to, to generate those digital twins cheaper. The second class is basically to improve twins. So now it's about, for example, improve model components by comparing model data to observations, learning model biases and errors, and quantifying uncertainties of predictions, and also quality control of observations, observation operators, and so on and so forth, but also feature detections, basically identify important features like fronts or, or tropical cyclones or something like this in the model output. The third group is about um, to the, the building of tools that enable new science that wasn't there before and wasn't possible before. And this could, for example, be impact models within model simulations. It could also be the, the fusion of different data sources, for example, to combine um, weather forecast model data or climate model data with observations and, and to learn one mapping, from, to learn the mapping from one to the next. Uh, it could be the quantification of uncertainties via this mapping procedure. Um, visualization tools are also, also Internet of Things data. For example, if you think about the mobile phone data or the social media data that is around. If you want to use this also for weather and climate predictions, machine learning will play a big role, I'm sure. And then finally, also to think about an unsupervised learning and causal discovery in this very complex systems. And now the last group <coughs> is actually about the uptake of the data by the community. And I would guess that this may be the most important one for this, this group here, because it really um, should be possible to use machine learning to bring the data that we develop and the, the, the data, data that we kind of um, or that it's falling out of our, our prediction systems closer to the end user. And this could be, for example, an SME in, in, in Germany or, or everywhere in Europe, but it could also be a policymaker or, um, or actually even like a normal citizen who wants to use this data. And if you think about application areas, this could, for example, be in health, that you bring your own health data, for example, on, um, on, on pollen and on allergies, for example, into the mix. And then you pr use machine learning to 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 link this data to your um, to the weather data that we provide. Or for energy, it could, for example, be that you learn local downscaling um, from the weather data to a specific um, power power generator, for example, um, a wind turbine or um, a photovoltaic. For transport, it could be that you want to combine weather data with um, with IoT data and information from from traffic um, sensors or whatnot. For pollution, you could, th for example, think about extracting sources of pollution um, from satellite data. For extremes, you could think about 
putting um, fire models into your, your weather and climate model and so on and so forth. So there are various ways how you can think about using machine learning in particular to kind of bring clo the, 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 the overall facility and infrastructure of, of weather data, digital twins and climate, more, climate predictions closer to the end user. So um, just a couple of, of um, research highlights that I want to kind of talk about, <clears throat> just to give you an impression of what we're actually working on when we, when we say we're working on machine learning. One of them is a model em emulation, and I already told you that you basically try to kind of take model components and emulate them using machine learning to make it more efficient. And what I've brought you here is one, one example where we looked into what we call the radiation scheme. So it's basically radiation coming from the sun interacting with the clouds in the vertical um, structure of the atmosphere. And then some, some of it is kind of resent to space, some of it go through the, to, the, to the ground, and it's kind of a very complicated process. And typically, um, in this process, we can't take three-dimensional cloud structures into account. So we just assume that clouds are horizontal layers, which is not quite right. Um, but we can't afford to actually kind of represent those clouds in 3D because it's too expensive. But what we've done here is um, we basically took machine learning now to emulate these cloud effects that we can represent in the model, but we can't use it operationally because it's too expensive using machine learning. And we basically get very good results. So if you think about the 3D effects um, of clouds, that we get, for example, from the South Pole to the North Pole here in this um, line, and, and the y-axis is the vertical, uh, is the, the, the vertical structure of the atmosphere. You see a certain pattern for both short wave and long wave radiation um, that is coming, is generated both by those clouds. And on the left side, you see the real difference for by conventional tools. And on the right side, you see the difference that we kind of diagnose with machine learning and neural networks. And if you now take the computational cost into account, then the neural network is basically coming for free. So to represent those cloud, um, cloud structures, we use a, a tool called Spartacus, which would be more than four times more expensive than the default scheme, the triple clouds. But the neural network is basically coming for free. So you get almost the same effect, but for, for um, a fraction of the, of the computational cost. Another thing is uncertainty quantification. So we, we now, um, this application here is basically providing you a mapping between IFS data. So IFS data is our normal weather forecast data at 10 kilometer resolution. This is over the UK now, and this is for precipitation fields. And an observation, which is um, the so-called Nimrod data set, which is at one kilometer resolution, much higher resolution, much higher fidelity. And you can use machine learning actually to, to learn the mapping between your model and your observations. And we do this here. Um, basically using um, generative adversarial networks, a specific structure of a neural network. And the the first line here is the model simulation. The second line is the obs observations. So that's the reference truth, if you want. And the third and fourth and fifth um, lines are different uh, realizations of these mapping procedures. And you will see that you actually get different realizations out of the same mapping. And they all look different, which is not not bad, but actually great, because um, you, when you perform this mapping procedure in principle, you have a lot of uncertainties, but by generating a lot of different realizations, the one, two, three here, you actually get um, the, the, not only the, the, an impression how it could look like, but also an uncertainty quantification with it. So actually, the mapping between data sets is very important, not only for deterministic reasons, but also to get an impression about the uncertainties. I'm going to skip this one. Um, and I'm going to go to the tropical cyclone detection. So this is now really about um, extracting information from the data. So think about running a global weather prediction model. And now you want to know where, for example, your tropical cyclones are. And um, to identify those, we basically use in this example here, machine learning again. So you basically literally identify features using machine learning tools. Um, when we assume that the, the model fields look like a picture, basically you will see the tropical cyclones here and you can use different machine learning techniques to identify those features. Okay, um, this is all I wanted to say. Um, just three points. I, I I hope that I convinced you that we have a, quite a large number of application areas for machine learning throughout the workflow. And that machine learning can hopefully really make a difference in some of them, at least. <clears throat> We're still at the beginning, so it's not that we are well established. I think um, mo most of the papers have been published in the last two years and we're still ramping up our efforts. And then finally, the important point to make is basically that machine learning is really should be able to also bring our data and the end user applications closer together. So if you have an, a, a, some applications that you would want to work within um, or, and, and try and test within whether and climate model output data, then machine learning could probably be your method of choice to realize this. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention.